There have been a lot of films that talk about forest fire prevention or about fighting fires. This film talks about lighting fires. Some fires are lighted to dispose of logging debris and to prepare forest sites for the next crop of trees. Some fires are lighted by hand with diesel fuel drip torches. Some fires are lighted to improve grazing land and to enhance important wildlife winter ranges. Fire causes immediate and dramatic changes in the environment. Some of these changes may be quite desirable, completely in keeping with human or social objectives. Or they may be just the opposite. The first and most obvious change is a color change. Red and orange in the burning for the long column of smoke to mark the place. For a brief period, the landscape is blackened and stark in the aftermath. But, like the fire itself, this stage is only temporary. Within a short time, new colors appear, sometimes multi-hued, but mostly green. I'm Ross Tozer. I'm a professional forester with the BC Ministry of Forests. I'm Ray DeMarchi. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Fish and Wildlife Branch of the British Columbia Ministry of Environment. For a long time, most people have believed that all forest and range fires were bad. But historically, fire has had a natural presence in the environment, just like wind or rainfall. We know that excessive amounts of either can be ruinous, but prescribed fire that fire which we apply on purpose is in a special category. We can apply it when we want and withhold it when we don't want it. Wildfires must be controlled as always, but foresters and other resource managers are learning that prescribed fire can be a useful tool in the management of many public resources. We know that fire has been altering the forest and range environment for thousands of years. In fact, for as long as there have been forests and grasslands, Fires have been occurring there. Quite naturally, fire has impacts on wildlife populations. But contrary to what many people might believe, these impacts are not always negative. In fact, fire can provide real benefits to many species of wildlife. Some forest plants are quite literally born of fire. BC's lodgepole pine, for instance, sometimes incorrectly referred to as jack pine, is an important commercial species and one which often flourishes in the wake of a major fire. The large forest fire burned through this site several decades ago. The new forest is now well established and is almost 100% lodgepole pine. Some tree species have built-in safeguards that allow them to survive contact with fire. A pretty firm indication of the historic presence of fire in the environment. This is a yellow pine tree, sometimes known as a ponderosa pine. You'll notice that the limbs are a long ways from the ground. That's because past fires have pruned the lower limbs of this particular tree. Also, the bark on the yellow pine is very thick, as you can see, providing good insulation to the tree's life support system inside. Usually one can find fire scars in these big yellow pine, indicating they have been repeatedly exposed to fire in the past, and still survived. But one of the most important lessons in fire management is that virtually each forest site and each species will respond to fire in a different manner. If a cedar, spruce, or other thin bark species had been exposed to fire, they probably would not have survived. Another tree with good fire resistant capability is the western larch. Many old burns in the BC interior contain larch veterans survivors of some past forest fire. Some are dead spikes, snow, wind and decay having stripped them of bark and limbs. 
These often become habitat for woodpeckers and cavity nesting birds. But it seems a few always survive a fire, though perhaps only barely alive, and they tower above the regenerating forest. The new trees may be large also, having been reseeded by these living relics in their own image. Trees are not the only plant species that have evolved through repeated contact with fire. Actually, we've only been excluding fire from BC's forests and rangelands for something like 75 years. For thousands of years before that, many plant species were being conditioned by repeated exposure to fire. Much of this slope is covered with yellow stem ceanothus, commonly called snowbrush or buckbrush, a vital forage plant for elk and deer in western North America. When you look closely, you can see that these plants have been heavily browsed or eaten down by the wildlife. It so happens that the seeds of ceanothus will lie dormant in the soil and they won't germinate unless they're exposed to fire temperatures, a situation that gives rise to the term fire dependent. Some grasslands are also fire dependent. The transition zone, or the edge, between a grassland and a forest may appear to be quite static, but actually it is just the opposite. Where the forest and the grassland confront each other, there is constant competition to see which of these plant communities will dominate. Before the white man started fighting fires, grasslands were maintained by the periodic actions of wildfires, or by native Indians, who used to set fires on purpose to create range for wildlife, and later, for their horses. On those sites from which fire has been excluded for a long time, the coniferous, or evergreen trees, become dominant, and the grassland begins to disappear. The grass plants are often the first species to appear after a fire, and so we call them pioneers. But other plants, shrubs, and finally the evergreens, follow in logical succession. So the process of regrowth that follows a major fire is simply called plant succession. Thus, the exclusion of fire works to the detriment of many grass plants, but to the advantage of forest plants like Douglas fir or lodgepole pine. So that condition in which coniferous trees are seen creeping in to occupy a grassland is a perfectly natural and very common occurrence. It is happening continuously in many parts of BC, including the Chilcotin, the Okanagan and Thompson Valleys, and the East Kootenai. Applied at the right time of year, fire can work as a thinning agent to reduce the number of coniferous trees on a given site. A springtime burn took place here. Nearly all the trees were touched by the fire, but only a few were killed. Thus, the site has been protected as a multiple use value for forestry, grazing, and wildlife because it was burned. In recent times, forest, range, and wildlife managers have cooperated on a planning process designed to help balance human demands with natural productivity. Some ranges are now in better condition than they have been for decades. The process is called coordinated resource management planning, and it involves natural resource agencies in both federal and provincial governments. Ranching is not nearly as large an industry as forestry, but nevertheless it provides important social benefits. Managing the rangeland of the province is one of the responsibilities of the Ministry of Forests. That means that livestock grazing lands must be maintained in good condition and those which have suffered from overgrazing or other abuses should be allowed to recover. Those agencies responsible for managing forests, grazing land, and wildlife all face the same problem. Human demands for all three resources are rising steadily. When an open grassland or shrub site is taken over by forest succession, however natural that process may be, the practice of forestry stands to gain since the size of the forest increases. But this is obviously a negative event for grazing livestock and wildlife since the invasion of forest plants 
lessens the value of the site for those other objectives. Among the agencies which managed forest, range and wildlife, as well as among the resource users they represent, there is continued debate over the matter of forest succession. It is obvious that intensive management and delicate negotiation will continue to be required in the future in order to maintain ecological diversity, to restore and maintain fire-dependent wildlife habitat, livestock grazing areas, and commercial forests. The coordinated resource management planning process and other similar programs have helped resolve this problem by bringing together all resource agencies and resource users, but we've still got a long way to go. In the East Kootenai, for example, our best estimates show that the combined numbers of elk, deer and bighorn sheep are about half of what they were in the 1950s. And the number of cows on Crown Range are down by about the same percentage. But as we attempt to satisfy human demands for more timber, more wildlife and more grazing land, we must be careful not to exceed the natural productivity of the site. So when it comes to prescribed fire, the decision to burn or not to burn must be based both on social and ecological criteria. Before any fire is applied, we must consider the ecological conditions of the site, as well as the social or human objectives we are attempting to satisfy. The need to guard against wildfire is as great as ever, but the need to apply more intensive management is also increasing. Among professional resource managers, there is now almost total agreement that if we are going to practice good forest management, or silviculture, if we are going to maintain good winter ranges for wildlife, if we want to control forest succession onto grasslands, then we will have to have more fire. This is a classic winter range for deer and elk. The problem is that the browse plants are over mature and new growth is at a minimum. Some plants have completely died out. But wildlife depend on this site in the wintertime. The easiest and cheapest way to rejuvenate it is to burn off the old plants so new growth can take their place. So despite the fact that it may be contrary to the traditional Bambi concept of fire control, fire is deliberately applied to benefit the elk and the deer. These burns are applied according to a definite prescription, a set of management objectives that take into account those all-important social and ecological criteria we spoke of. At one time, a site like this would likely have been classed as not satisfactorily restocked since it contains so few conifer trees. That kind of classification is changing in recognition that the site has high value for wildlife winter range. It is better dedicated to that purpose, and the pure forest management effort can be concentrated elsewhere where it will produce more favorable results. When larger areas require burning, more advanced forms of technology are required. This helicopter is being fitted with a fire lighting machine, which operates on a fascinating chemical and mechanical principle. Light plastic balls, similar to ping pong balls, are placed in the top of the machine and spit out at regular intervals. The balls contain potassium permanganate, a chemical which bursts into flame when mixed with glycol, much like common antifreeze. The machine injects glycol into the balls just before they are dropped from the helicopter. Shortly after they hit the ground, they burst into flame, burning for about a minute. This system demands delicate, even meticulous flying skills. But a large area can be burned in a matter of minutes. The site being burned here is used as winter habitat by mountain sheep, deer and elk. The burning is being done in late spring after the animals have left the winter range for the high country. By the time they return to this setting in winter, the plants will have been rejuvenated by the fire and will have added an entire season of new growth. The day after the fire, the landscape was blackened and stark. The fire was highly successful from both a social 
and an ecological point of view. The old dead plants were mostly consumed by the fire. In a matter of weeks, the transition is spectacular. The signs of new growth are everywhere, black and green. Spring flowers such as this delicate shooting star are in abundance. This is spreading phlox. The sunflower. The cat's ear. And the pasque flower. These animals are California bighorn sheep. They are native to some grassland environments in central and southern BC. This band is located at the junction of the Fraser and Chilcotin rivers, where bighorn have existed for centuries. They also have a dependency on fire, since they require, as habitat, ecological conditions which only fire can provide. Open grasslands, uninvaded by conifer stands. But it must be emphasized that random burning is not the answer. Each burn must be applied according to exacting prescriptions and those social and ecological criteria must always be stressed and understood. While there is no longer any doubt that prescribed fire provides benefits for some species of wildlife, it must be kept in mind that the requirements of all species are not the same. We know that elk, moose and deer can benefit from habitats that have been treated with fire, but they also require dense forests for cover. Other species, such as woodland caribou, some species of fur bearers, and many species of birds do not require burned areas as habitat. In plain terms, it can be stated that some animals benefit from fire and others don't. It is true that more consideration is being given to wildlife and grazing values, but without question, the enormous job of maintaining a wood supply for the BC forest industry will always remain a priority with the Forest Service. One of the many problems in the forest management challenge concerns the vast areas of overstocked coniferous forest sites. Overcrowding prevents these trees from reaching a useful size. Although these yellow pines are alive, they are all but dormant. They are four to six inches in diameter but are close to 60 years old. So the stand was thinned with the use of power chainsaws. The practice is known to every gardener. Reduce competition so the selected trees have room to grow. But if this clutter of dead trees were left on the ground, it would soon become a dangerous fire hazard, as well as a breeding ground for insects which could attack the surviving trees. Modern technology has taken a lot of the guesswork out of determining fire hazard. This instrument measures percentage of moisture when its two sensing points are touched to a given surface. The debris from this thinning exercise was left to cure for an entire year. Then, when the moisture conditions were just right, it was set on fire. Again, a drip torch is the tool used. A crew of Forest Service personnel, led by people with a good knowledge of firefighting and fire behavior, moves through the four-foot-high layer of dead and dying material. The fire is lighted on a line which lets it advance through the debris. The timing of such a fire is absolutely critical. Social factors, such as safety to the surrounding forest and to human habitation, must always be considered. Ecological factors such as weather, the timing of new spring growth, even the time of day, are equally important. 100% positive results cannot be guaranteed. The fire creates its own environment once it gets going. Lower limbs and the odd top are seen to catch fire. But remember, these are yellow pine, the species with historic contact with fire. Still, some of the crowns are consumed. This is the greatest worry, for the crown is that portion of the tree which is vital to producing the necessary chemistry for growth. After the fire, the immediate prospects do not look too encouraging. 
Did we say black and green? But on closer examination, it is seen that the crowns are alive. This is new green growth, which has occurred since the prescribed burn. These trees will make it. They have been virtually fireproofed by the prescribed burn. The site has been opened up to allow sunlight to reach the forest floor. The trees have room to grow. The small amount of debris that remains is no obstacle to wildlife or cattle, and the fire hazard has all but been removed. This adjoining site was burned two years ago. The trees are thriving, benefiting from the fire and the thinning program, and on the ground, in the spaces between the trees, prime grazing plants such as blue bunch wheatgrass are well established. We have been spending quite a bit of time talking about interior forest sites with their varied environments, which are used for wildlife, domestic grazing, as well as forestry. But in the rainforest of the lower coast and the interior wet belt, quite different conditions apply. Prescribed fire can also provide important benefits in this kind of setting. After a wet belt site has been logged, the debris left behind must be burned to reduce fire hazard, to prevent outbreak of insects, and to prepare the site for the next crop of trees. Here, a helicopter-borne drip torch lays backfire at the top of a big clear cut. In subsequent passes, the pilot places strips of fire on the lower reaches of the clear cut. The rising heat column, or convection, draws the fire upward in a controlled firestorm. The practice of using fire in this kind of setting is also taken straight from nature. Over the centuries, dead or dormant forests have been periodically swept by wildfire. It is nature's way of ending one stage of plant succession and starting the process anew. The clear-cut logging method, followed by prescribed fire and tree planting, is thereby not nearly so unnatural an event as its detractors would like to believe. In addition, Failure to dispose of debris after logging creates a dangerous fire hazard as the debris becomes tinder dry. With respect to these conditions, forest managers have been known to use a sober cliché. You can light them now, or fight them later. A full year has passed since this site was burned, and the tree planters have now moved into the clear cut. The tiny seedlings are dwarfed by small shrubs at first, but the passage of a few years makes a great difference to a young forest. By the time the new trees are 10 to 15 feet high, often no more than a decade, the once clear-cut and burned over site has become a forest again. Even at this stage, the management effort has not ended. For decades to come, this forest must be carefully tended and protected from wildfire to be logged again in its turn. On some clear cuts where the fireweed reveals its own dependence on fire, Mother Nature often provides a welcome bonus. The huckleberry, as black bears and other berry pickers are quick to learn, is found most abundantly in those areas recently burned. This is a dead forest of lodgepole pine. An insect called the mountain pine beetle is responsible for this condition. Its presence in lodgepole pine forests is highly destructive, but perfectly natural. And outbreaks like this can be found in many parts of BC. This one, about 200,000 acres in size, is in the Flathead River Valley in the East Kootenai region. Other outbreaks in the province are even larger. The beetles didn't stop at the international boundary either. They kill trees in Montana or British Columbia, showing no favoritism whatever. The Forest Service has opened up great fire breaks as a safety measure, for the dead forest has now become an awesome fire hazard. 
The plain truth is that Mother Nature does not operate according to human, social criteria, but according to strict ecological standards alone. We kept fire from this forest to save it for commercial forestry, but the beetles got there first. Salvage logging and other techniques are being applied to stem the beetles' advance. Where the outbreaks are still quite small, affected trees are being felled, bucked, and burned. This is a slow, expensive process involving a great deal of hand labor, and there is no guarantee of success. But such methods are being undertaken in an effort to try and check the spread of the beetle and prevent a disastrous forest fire from sweeping the vast areas of beetle-killed pine. But the beetles are winning, and the risk of a great firestorm grows with each passing year. The question of prescribed fire is just about the same as that encountered in all aspects of land use. Namely, a management solution which may be ideal for one purpose may be just the opposite for something else. The forester and the forest service must strive to meet growing public demands for more wood. This means that we have to be very careful in how we manage the forest resource in order to maintain a wood supply. The wildlife biologist and the fish and wildlife branch, we have clients too. People use wildlife. They hunt them, they like to look at them, they want to know they're being cared for. The province of BC is vast in area, but much of it is inaccessible or above timberline. The really productive growing sites are surprisingly few in number. And the human demands for more wood, more range, and more wildlife, these keep increasing all the time. The Ministry of Forests is committed by law to a program of multiple use on forest lands. This doesn't mean that we feel that we can satisfy the sum of all demands, but they are a reality and we must consider them. It does mean that we must manage more intensively in the future and use those management techniques, fire included, that will enable us to do the job without harming the productivity of the land. The fundamental resource management question remains. What are we going to use the land for? For wood? For livestock? For wildlife? for other human objectives, or for some combination of them all. There are no simple answers, and as public pressures on the land base increase, the need for flexible and innovative management programs will become more vital to us all. What about those wildlife habitats that we burned? In the dead of winter, we went back, and the critters were there. The hunting season had ended, and the snow had pushed them down from the high country onto the winter ranges we had burned. There is a more broad-minded approach on all sides to the question of fire management today. The fundamentalist positions and the old biases of the past are changing. <laughs>